for the stage. Good morning. Uh, thanks, Tom, for the very kind introduction. It's been uh, it's been really wonderful to uh, partner with Aldevron and also make relationships with the extended network of clients that Aldevron works. With. Um, so today, I want to focus my story on thinking about precision with genome editing. And uh, we're part of a number of networks uh, and national initiatives. One is uh, called CMAT, Cell Manufacturing Technology Center, funded by and supported by NSF and a, a consortium of industry partners. Also, uh, a newly, a relatively new effort at NIH called Somatic Cell Genome Editing Initiative. So we're part of two awards in the first round there that are looking to uh, profile adverse events upon the introduction of editors in vivo, and also new delivery strategies to deliver editors. So uh, I want to jump right in and uh, talk about how we think about precision. We laid this out in a recent opinion piece, and um, we heard already earlier today about uh, off-target edit editor editing at low site other than the uh, diseased allele. Another number two here is uh, the idea of inserting a piece of DNA uh, at the correct place and uh, perhaps preventing the formation of other insertions and deletions at the target site. And that's going to be the focus of my talk uh, today. Uh, there's another concept here, uh, number three, of uh, making sure that the edited allele is properly and precisely expressed um, as you intend to. And uh, one of my students, Nicole Piscopo, will be talking about some of our efforts there in T cells. And number four is getting the editor to the right uh, cell or tissue of interest. And uh, a number of ways you could, we just heard about um, evolving viruses, perhaps to get you to the right place. But you can, we're, we're interested in non-viral approaches to deliver the editor right cell. And another key resource that my lab works on, and I'll be talking about two examples here, is uh, a really fantastic stem cell engineering um, community at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And there's large biobanks um, that have, you know, almost a uh, few thousand uh, iPS cells induced pluripotent stem cells that have unique uh, mutant alleles as well as SNPs. And we can also make our own line from a patient that we think uh, has a very interesting disease phenotype within about three weeks in an um, episomal type. And this has been very popular in terms of toxicology and, and preclinical um, testing of, of um, small molecules and biologics. My lab is really interested in using this as a platform to um, develop new genome editors. And uh, a number of applications that I think are exciting here is that you can take these uh, patient-specific cell lines and make disease models and do functional assays. And so I'll be telling you today about um, some mechanistic studies of what happens once we uh, disrupt a mutant allele as well as correct a mutant allele in two different uh, diseases. We can also think about how we characterize um, adverse events from potentially off-target edit. So um, there's, there's an opportunity here with uh, micro tissues, let's say of the heart or the retina or the brain, to see functionally what happens to um, cells that have very high off-target uh, mutagenesis. And then, because it's patient specific, you can think about looking at the effects of SNPs and also test the um, effects of host factors that may vary depending on um, uh, receptors and other trafficking machinery that can change how your editor would be delivered inside the cell, as well as variable DNA machinery that may um, defer based on uh, the exact cell or tissue type. And I'll, I'll be focusing uh, a lot of my uh, story today about non-viral approaches. 
We just heard a great, uh, great story about AAV and the potential uh, upsides of uh, using that as a delivery vector. Uh, there's also a number of challenges that Luke just laid out. Um, and uh, we're really interested in non-viral ways, uh, also arguably because for the genome editing space, we want to be able to um, really limit the lifetime of the nuclease in the cell. We heard from Matt that it really matters how long you have the nuclease um, inside the cell um, to get a, uh, the proper edit. Okay, so, so two stories today. One is gonna be focused on the eye, and we're focused on a macular dystrophy called Best Disease. And then in the second part, I'll talk about some unpublished work um, on Pompe disease, it's a lysosomal storage disorder. And the first case is disrupting a, a mutant allele, so we just have to cut and destroy, and we've had developed these um, packaging uh, nanocapsules is what we call them. And then in the second part, we've developed uh, a bit longer uh, nanoparticle that we call the simplex, and I'll tell you why we call it that, uh, that we can package within a polyplex, again, a non-viral delivery. So we, um, the retina has very diverse causes of uh, inherited um, disease, and uh, I don't have a pointer, but in the lower uh, green, there's best one that's uh, in, uh, been implicated in, 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 in many patients, and it's the um, second most common inherited form of uh, vision loss um, that you can point to a single gene. And it's incredibly complex. This is a transmembrane um, homopentamer ion channel. Uh, all the red dots here are the autosomal dominant form. 99% uh, of the cases are actually autosomal dominant. And there are some few autosomal recessive forms that have, are actually being addressed uh, by some uh, gene therapy companies. One of the challenges here is that the autosomal dominant forms actually cannot be well modeled in animal models. Uh, so therefore, uh, human stem cell-based models is arguably one of the, the uh, best tools that we have to look uh, for phenotypes in these types of different mutations, um, as well as look for rescue upon editing uh, the mutant allele. And so here we partner with uh, David Gamm, uh, where he has developed directed differentiation technologies to make optic vesicle cups. These have photoreceptors. These are organoids that float in the dish. And then also 2D monolayers of RPE cells um, that uh, uh, are functionally very uh, similar to what you would find inside patients in animal models. Um, so one of the tools that we uh, developed was to correct mutations in the IPS state. Uh, we take advantage of uh, single-stranded um, oligonucleotides as well as a plasmid-based system that has a 2A pyramycin uh, resistance cassette. And so uh, the resistance here is um, useful in the, about day one to day four, and it's a transient pyramycin selection which enrich, enriches for cells that have lots of um, plasmid in them and is tightly linked to Cas9 because it's a, a 2A strategy. And what we see is that if you get the pyramycin selection right, um, on the right here, as you go from zero pyramycin in the dish, you get almost no editing in the gray bar, but then as you um, go to increasing amounts of pyramycin, you get more and more editing. So almost about half of our clones that we isolate after two weeks have um, edits in them. And if you have a moderate uh, selection, you can have almost 20% of your clones have um, a uh, correction of the mutation. That you have. So we've gone in and looked at whether we can um, edit the mutant allele specifically uh, and benchmarked it against corrected lines that we generated through that process. And we have these IPS lines that have two copies of the normal gene, and on the left we have a Cas9 strategy that targets the mut mutant allele, and as expected, there's almost no red bars there, meaning that it's a very specific type of strategy to edit the mutant allele, whereas if we use a 
virus, lentiviral cassette here, to target the wild type allele, we get robust editing. And then in the patient-derived line, we get very strong editing of the mutant allele. And if we look at them, uh, nearly two-thirds of them uh, actually generate a frame shift or a loss of mutant um, uh, transcripts from nonsense created decay. We've actually looked at this in different cell types generated from iPS cells and in the mature um, directed differentiated RPE tissue. And we see actually a, a much higher percentage of frame shifts in the um, directed differentiated RPE tissue such that we get more nonsense created there indicating this strategy um, could be very efficient at destroying um, the mutant allele. We al have also done single cell RNA-seq um, on these types of tissues. In this case, it's an uh, organoid. And um, on the left is a TSNE plot um, generated from the 10x genomics platform. And you can see we have cones, we have rods, photoreceptors, and we have a few other cell types. And when we express the genome editor, we actually don't see any appreciable um, transcriptional change that deviates from what you would see um, in the unedited um, optic vessel. And so we're, we're increasingly profiling these types of strategies to specifically see what happens when we perturb the mutant allele. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we've used viral vectors as a tool there to discover um, how, how far we can destroy the mutant allele, but we'd really like to be able to deliver um, the cutting machinery without the virus. And here we've developed a really thin nanocapsule that falls apart inside the cell. That's uh, very small disulfide bonds that may be hard to see in the purple shell there. And we can also uh, decorate the sh um, nanocapsule with various targeting like That's the um, triangles on uh, the cartoon. And what we've done is we've started some in vivo experiments that we're just finishing um, characterizing. And we've in injected these into the back of the, the eye. Uh, again, we're looking at best disease where we want to edit the mutant allele. And we've uh, done it in this reporter mouse that if you, do, if you have successful gene editing, you would see a, a red signal because we're excising a stop cassette in, in these uh, mice. And you'll see the, the eyes here after two weeks of delivery of our nanocapsules that have been flat mounted um, into these uh, florets. And so on the top here is the delivery of a nanocapsule that has no targeting ligand. And um, within the injection blab, which is in the circle, we see very high editing, lots of uh, TD tomato expression. And then uh, in the bottom panel here is one that's decorated with a ligand that uh, targets to RPE. And we see even more editing and within our blab there. And so locally, we can get um, up to 50 to 70% of cells edited. And in these types of uh, scenarios where you really only need to fix a small part of the retina, the RPE for best disease, we're, we're excited for it. Um, I want to switch gears here to talk about uh, fixing mutations. And I think this is a harder problem. Um, and uh, it requires, uh, especially in the body, um, delivery of many components. And so uh, we, we talked about, uh, at least Matt also introduced this idea that you can have these short oligonucleotide templates where you can go from um, either uh, NHEJ and end joining or homology directed repair. And this is an example of the types of outcomes we get when we try to knock in a cassette in blue. Uh, and these are the sequencing results that we get. Um, in, in one run here in iPS cells. So we get, the, we get some reads that have the right knock-in without any errors, but we also get um, the knock-in with a mutation upstream, a deletion upstream, a deletion inside the cassette, and also the NHEJ product. And uh, over doing this at many genes, on average, using standard approaches, we would get about four times more imprecise reads than the intended read we wanted. And so, um, this is a problem because you can have uh, many uh, alleles in your cell population. And uh, we thought, rather than 
delivering everything um, in, uh, in the electroporation cuvette separately, um, having the RNP and the donor template not linked, could we link it somehow? And what we did is we added an aptamer called S1M um, to the guide RNA that can act like biotin and therefore streptavidin, which has a high affinity to biotin, can bring in um, the donor DNA template that has biotin. So I'll walk you through this story here that um, S1 was a aptamer found in um, 2013 that mimics um, biotin and M is for modification to, to stabilize the stem loop and it has a KD of about 29 nanomolar. We put this at three different locations um, within the sgRNA uh, based on the crystal structure of Cas9 and guide and all three of them work, SD, sgRNA1 in the top here works the best uh, in, for some of our assays. When we look at what nanoparticles um, are generated when we specifically have that aptamer versus not, um, the green trace here shows that it's um, an increase in size relative to all of the other control particles that we looked at um, with the various components of this uh, nanoparticle. And then um, we can see that they're intact inside cells. And I'm going to actually probably go a little bit quickly here since this is uh, published uh, last year. And um, what we also see at two different loci, um, a blue fluorescent protein transgene as well as an endogenous gene, uh, GAA, which is implicated in Pompeii disease, um, incorporation of the intended template um, is about tenfold higher here relative to any imprecise reads that we get in our cells. So this is in iPS cells, and at both cases, um, the standard approaches here are on the left where you have less than one ratios of precise edits to imprecise edits. And when we use our simplex here, we get about tenfold jump in, in the number of reads that we have. Um, that are precise relative to We can also add cargos that are fluorescent, and we can also cleave them inside the cell depending on how we link it to this machinery. And this is a quantum dot example. And so this is a summary of that story from last year, and we really want to see whether this could um, uh, be pushed further to correct multiple alleles. And the reason we wanted to look at correcting not just one, but two alleles, is that um, in some compound heterozygous disorders, you have both alleles knocked out. This is Pompeii disease. Some, some people call this a floppy baby type of phenotype. And the reason um, this occurs is that glycogen in, in the muscles builds up inside the lysosome. And um, the, the hope here is that if you could provide some of the enzyme to break down the lysosome, um, not the lysosome, the glycogen inside the lysosome, you could generate glucose to rescue the phenotype. And so there is a, um, a number of IPS lines that we got from patients at Wisconsin. This is one example where you have a mutation in, in two alleles from the mom and, and the dad. Um, so this story that I'll say for the next few slides will focus on this G to A mutation in allele 1 and a deletion of T at position 140, uh, 1441 um, in the coding sequence here. And you can see that what we've done is generated repair templates, these oligonucleotides that encode the correct insertion of the T on the left and then also the uh, G to A transition. And what we can also do is add some wobble uh, changes uh, inside the PAM of the CRISPR strategy that allows us to track um, the edited allele relative to the um, endogenous allele. And so we use that simplex technology. What we did is we had two different fluorophores encoding the um, cutting guide with the uh, repair template for one allele and another allele um, labeled in uh, Alexa Floor 647 to correct allele 2. And we 
uh, looked for phenotype rescue. Because the lysosome pH is sensitive to the activity of the correct uh, GAA, we can look for clones that um, have the proper rescue of at least a lysosomal pH. And using this strategy, which actually was uh, admittedly pretty difficult to do, um, we did actually systematically isolate lines that had each correction, so either the del T correction or the GA correction, or both corrected. And so we were uh, wondering, what is the phenotype of these cells? And I'm not going to bore you through the sequencing, but the sequencing um, looked uh, as expected from these incorporation of the uh, single base pair mutation as well as the wobbles. Um, we were also worried about some of these large scale uh, insertions or deletions, so we did a long range PCR that looked uh, very clean. We looked at karyotypes and pluripotency markers. Everything looked quite good at the iPS cell stage. And then um, what we wanted to see is what happens upon um, uh, transcription. So the diagram at the top, because there's two alleles and um, multiple um, different exons that we wanted to look at, uh, the diagram's at the top. And the first exon that encodes one of these types of uh, mutations um, on the top, you'll see on the far left is the disease compound heterozygote, where both alleles are, have not been corrected. And then as you march uh, to the right, you'll see the single corrected ones versus the double corrected. And what we see is that the corrected allele is actually overrepresented in our sequencing reads uh, for the mRNA, such that it's 83% to 71% of um, the reads. We also look at the next exon that is mutated on the other allele, and we see a similar type of um, trend, overrepresentation of the edited, corrected allele. And then we also look at the end of uh, the mRNA, and again, we see um, higher levels here. Um, in this case, uh, we can't track uh, either allele um, through the correction. Um, one important point here relative to gene augmentation is that we have a pretty physiological processing of the protein because we're not flooding the cell with lots of protein. We're taking advantage of endogenous transcriptional machinery. And so this Western blot shows the similar type of precursor in inactive forms as we would see in a uh, healthy cell. We also looked at um, secretion of this enzyme. So in uh, lysosomal storage disorders, you can also have um, this cross-correction phenotype where the edited cell can secrete the corrected edited protein to correct neighboring cells. And here we see about two to three-fold um, higher secretion up in the double-corrected cells. We took these cells and differentiated them to cardiomyocytes, which is the one of the relevant tissues here for Pompe disease. And um, here is, uh, we also see rescue when we use um, the media that's secreted from the edited cells on the disease cells. And this uh, green here on, from the double corrected shows that the pH in the lysosomal uh, and, uh, compartment is uh, being rescued. We look at thousands of cells, and we actually see a quicker and more robust rescue whenever we correct both alleles relative to the single allele. And this is uh, arguably faster, uh, if not just as fast, as the standard recombinant enzyme replacement therapies that's shown on the far right. And this uh, persists at 96 hours. So uh, one of the things um, in the last minute here that I want to highlight is that this is actually a pretty complicated system. Um, not only do you have to think about all the kinetics of delivery of the editors, you also want to think about which cells inside a tissue for an in vivo situation do you want to edit. And we made a simple model of progenitors and mature cells. And uh, in this case, how uh, we should think about targeting one or both alleles. And because we're engineers, we, we developed these um, 
models that I won't have time to walk through, but we, we are developing these. And um, we can watch the editing of both alleles in the progenitor cells, uh, as well as simultaneous editing of both alleles. And these um, uh, nomenclature is, is shown here. And we can sh watch this happen in a uh, differentiating progenitor into mature. And because the kinetics aren't um, that obvious, we wanted to see what happens if we edit a lot of progenitors that contribute and take over the tissue versus trying to um, edit uh, mostly mature cells. This is, these are design strategies that, as a um, genome editor, you'd like to know uh, what your benchmarks need to be to, to get phenotype rest. And so um, we can simulate repeated dosing of editors, and we can see that uh, in this case, about six infusions can get you up to about 2% editing uh, with the, the numbers that we got from our um, uh, Pompeii disease line studies. And it matters whether you have a very precise editor or not. On the right, you have very high precision editor with only 2% editing. You get more healthy cells in your tissue than having a very high efficiency delivery system that's not as precise because you end up losing a lot of your target sites um, that you want to edit. And we have heat maps here that talk about trade-offs between precision and uh, efficiency. Based on some studies in literature, we think that uh, about 3 to 7 percent in these lysosomal storage disorders, um, at least in Pompeii disease, would be advantageous. And um, it also matters how cooperative it is. So that effect of um, editing both alleles um, can really uh, also shift uh, how much you need to deliver. So we're working through this. And I want to say that we have this polyplex nanocarrier that's been published um, uh, that delivers at least in ex vivo, um, in vitro, as well as lipofectamine. We're, we're thinking of, and moving this in in vivo. And uh, lastly, I want to highlight my students' um, work on CAR T cells uh, for poster 108. Nicole, she's been uh, really uh, pioneering all of the work on trying to move some of these genome editing technologies in patient-derived T cells. And so to summarize here, uh, I want to say that Precision can be achieved by uh, working around the nuclease, and here the reagents from Aldevron have been very helpful for our lab. Um, targeting multiple alleles could lead to significant rescue in some nonlinear ways that we're trying to understand. And these are, I think, really interesting off-the-shelf reagents for all sorts of applications. And this is acknowledgement of uh, the team, notably Jared, who um, just graduated and started at Syntago. Um, as well as Tava for the, the modeling work. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to come up here for the, the Q and A. Um, so please step up to the to the mics if you have any specific uh, questions, Chris. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask Chris a little bit about is delivery. Uh, no matter what conference you go to. Um, delivering these things, especially in vivo, is something that always comes up. There are, there are ways that our people are figuring out for ex vivo how to do it. Learned about that from Matt. But can you talk a little bit about, a little bit more about those the nano capsules? And is there any precedent relative to using those actually format um, that you can maybe talk a little bit more about? Yeah, so, so the nano capsules. Um have a chemistry that's actually nucleated on the surface of the protein. Uh, so they're actually a very thin shell, um, are about less, around 10 nanometers. So the Cas9 RNP is about 8 nanometers or so. This adds about another. So it's around the 20 nanometer range. And I think that's, um, you know, uh, almost an order of magnitude lower than some of the lipid-based uh, larger um, liposomal delivery strategies. So that could have some advantages in dense tissues, particularly the brain is something that we're excited about. Um, and also, there's some chemistry advantages uh, for what we have that um, we could put peptides, we could put um, 
uh, small molecules using standard bioconjugate. Uh, but it is a hard challenge. I mean, I think we're, we're focused on applications where we only need the nuclease around arguably for a few hours, maybe a few days. Um, and uh, I really like the protein-based system because um, you don't have persistent expression um, that you would have versus viral strategies uh, that could lead to off-target And so in some applications, I think non-viral is, is quite exciting. I think the best disease scenario in particular is one that we're excited about. Um, but in others where you have maybe a loci that's much harder to cut and you need longer duration, a viral approach would be probably better. Just a quick question. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. I'm wondering about the size limit in these carriers. Do you have a limit of gene that you can deliver? And second, can you talk about manufacturing complexities of these entities? Thank you. Sorry, the, the second part was back. Yeah, just, just to manufacture these yeah. things on large scale for okay. applications. Thank yeah, you. so uh, the first question about capacity, the nanocapsule, because it's really nucleated, I would argue, on the protein, um, it, it hasn't been easy to incorporate extra components like the simplex that I talked about, and that's why we've developed this larger polyplex um, that's on the order of about 100 to accommodate the, the template as well as the streptavidin. Um, and then the second question about manufacturing, I, I think you know many of the monomers are just standard um, uh, PEG and acrylic acid and, and things that um, should not be difficult to scale. Any more questions? I have uh, one other one that I wanted to mention. Um, we talked about, and Matt mentioned earlier, and we've seen it quite a bit, that there are 6,000 to 10,000 monogenetic differences, and you had talked about being able to edit two specific alleles, um, which is more complicated but more exciting for people that have more complex disease condition. Can you talk a little bit about, by editing two separate spots in the genome, what additional disease, you know, gene surgery that, that actually opens uh, up for the, for the medical world? Yeah, so, you know, for an autosomal recessive disorder, the, the assumption has been you just need one um, correction for rescue, and I think that can be done, but I think you could also target the, the other diseased allele is what we found that could re really um, have a nonlinear effect in terms of how much treat to, to maybe overcome some of the delivery, um, the delivery constraints. So, in that sense, I, I don't think the editors in the world here should only think about one target per person, per patient. Um, there's a number of polygenic disorders that um, you, know, you could systematically go in and, and fix. It is very far from application, I would argue, in terms of um, getting there, but it is, you know, I think, very appropriate on the research side to think about um, what numbers and constraints are there that we can work on in the research community such that it becomes, um, you know, hopefully the patient soon. Um, maybe, maybe one last um, question. Um, during the previous years, we talked a little bit about how you're trying to apply this specifically to CAR therapy or CAR T therapy and, and, and the work that's being done at University of Wisconsin. Um, can you talk a little bit about, more about that? You talked about um, your graduate student also connecting with the group there. What, what's happening actually at the University yeah. of Wisconsin as it relates to how you're trying to bring this act? Yeah, so as you heard today, um, I didn't have time to go into the T cell story. That's a little bit on purpose because I knew Michelle, uh, the, Nicole could talk at the poster session about it. Um, we have a pretty growing community at Wisconsin of clinicians. We are one of the sites that does Kimraya infusion, so um, there's a lot of know-how, I think, in terms of on the clinical side of how to apply it. Um, we heard, I think, a very accurate uh, description of the manufacturing challenges, and this uh, CMAT center 
um, we're thinking about new technologies to think about that intra um, uh, patient heterogeneity that I think we could have new technologies, potency sensors, new transduction methods, modification methods um, that could address that challenge. Um, certainly the, the, the time scales are shrinking, so you know, there's new paradigms I think that we're excited about exploring at Wisconsin. There's no other questions. Uh, can give a round of applause for Chris, please. Yeah.